It's like that Oxbridge trick that you hear about. <laughs> Very good point. Sit you on a comfy chair and get you to say terrible things. <laughs> I'll take this. Right, well. shall we start? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you all for coming. So this is the first of uh, the second term of this series. We've also got um, late in the term Margaret Hodge. Not late in the term, she's on Thursday, in fact. Um, we've got Michael Gove and Morris Glassman. Should we be entertaining a double act? Paul Mason coming. We may have another session as well, but today we hand over to Paul War, who's talking to Lisa. Lisa and Andy, thanks for coming, Lisa. Thank you. I'm Paul War from the Huffington Post in London, and I have the pleasure of uh, having done this before with Lisa at party conference for HuffPost. We did a live event, and it was thoroughly entertaining and informative, crucially, and I hope this will replicate that experience. Um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Lisa. She might need some extra prop. prop. I brought no. a prop. <laughs> delighted to welcome Lisa, who was the Shadow Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, as you're all aware. She's the MP for Wigan. Uh, she's very much not in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet right now. Uh, Thanks, we can possibly discuss that later. The format for this, as you're probably aware, is that I'll chat to, to Lisa for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we really want to open it up to as many questions as possible. So I'll kick off with a really, really easy one. Um, Hang on a sec. Here we go. I've brought a prop. Do you know, I oh, thought that good. the theme of tonight might be about hope. So I don't know if anyone remembers this. <laughs> for those of you who can't read it, it says, Choose Change. Vote Cruddus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's here. <laughs> what was that for? That was, um, deputy leader. That was the uh, failed deputy leadership uh, that he ran a few yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're making him embarrassed now. <laughs> OK, Lisa and Andy. Um, this weekend, uh, I was in Washington, and I was watching Prime Minister Theresa May with President Donald Trump in the White House discussing life after Brexit. Now, those three bits of that sentence a year ago were unthinkable. Uh, well, certainly the Donald Trump bit, and maybe the Brexit bit, and maybe the Theresa May bit. Um, what went wrong for the left to get into such a position? God, this is cheerful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, first of all, I guess what I would say is that uh, I don't really agree with the premise of the question. I don't think it was unthinkable. Certainly, Brexit wasn't unthinkable. Um, and I think if you come to towns like mine, it was very apparent from before David Cameron even announced that we were having a referendum, that it was likely that that would be lost. For decades, the public debate about the EU has been relentlessly negative. The EU has been used as a scapegoat for a lot of other failings, failings of successive governments, including my own party when we were in government. And uh, there has been no positive debate to balance that, to speak of. And so I knew that we were probably going to lose about a week after David Cameron called the referendum. And I stood in a, a Unite office in the middle of Wigan with about 100 trade unionists from across our region who were 99% negative about the European Union, many of them shaking with rage. And it was very obvious then that there was something much deeper going on than just the question of the European Union. Although they did understand the question and they did have very strong views on the EU as well, but I think that was foreseeable. And actually I, I went to America before Trump won and I can't honestly say that I predicted that he was going to win but I did have an inkling when we went that they might be in real trouble because we went to, uh, we went across America, we were looking at clean energy schemes and how they've used a combination of incentives and regulation to drive investment into places across the US and to create the most incredible clean energy jobs for young people there in a way that we have never ever managed here. And, um, we met with the Hillary for America campaign and they, I asked them the very specific question that is part of the dilemma facing the Labour Party and the country at the moment, which is, you know, you've obviously got one set of voters who support you, who are largely city-based, you know, very metropolitan, very liberal in outlook, but presumably you have the same problem that we have, which is on the other hand, you have another set of voters who are 
many of the people that I represent in Wigan, from towns, much more working class, feel very anxious about the future and have very, very different views on some major issues like immigration and social security, European Union, human rights. When those two things rub up against one another, what do you do? And essentially, the answer was tactical. It was, you know, for in American politics, there isn't the sort of pluralism that we've seen in British politics in recent years, and those voters simply don't have anywhere else to go. So those people in towns, what now has become known as the sort of left behinds, they have nowhere else to go, so essentially we can bank that support and we can nail our colours to a mast and, and pursue those, those values that, that rub up against many of the things that we're hearing there. And we went to some towns and I was increasingly concerned by what I was hearing. And I can't say for a moment that I predicted Trump, but I think actually what is happening in Britain and what's been happening for a very long time is global. It's certainly been happening in Germany and in France and in Holland and in the United States. And I suspect that it's a much bigger problem than that. And do you think then that um, if there is anything distinctive about Labour's problem as opposed to the global problem for the left, what would you put your finger on if, if, if we're talking about just Labour in Britain? Um, are there any unique reasons why Labour's in the state it's in at the moment? It's certainly when it comes to polling. So I don't, think it's, um, I don't think it's completely unique, but again, what I would say is I think this has very deep roots. So first of all, and quite obviously, if any of you are politically active, if you're politically active for Labour, you'll have an idea of what I mean is the emotional disconnect between Labour and the public. So I think for a very long time... We've known that we've become very sort of technical and managerial in the way that we talked about politics and the way that we did politics. But I think it's bigger than that. I think we had completely underestimated and misunderstood the power of emotion and feeling in politics. I think when people make decisions about politics, it isn't just the rational, self-interested, calculating human being that is making choices that are in their own self-interest. I think actually there's something far deeper and much more emotive going on there. And the best example of that is when you go door knocking in areas where the top concern is always immigration, but there is very little if no immigration into the area. And when you start digging beneath what people are talking about, if you start really trying to listen to what people are telling you, they're telling you a story about loss and uncertainty and change and feeling absolutely helpless and powerless in the face of that. And I think that that disconnect has been compounded by that cultural rift that I was talking about. Labour has, in Britain, I think, has over a long period of time retreated very much to the cities in terms of our membership and our representatives and who has voice and clout and authority in the party. And I think we are in danger of compounding that through the devolution model that George Osborne has handed to us because it's very much built on this premise that cities are at the centre of their regions and that city growth can then help to drag outer areas along with them. And that the major challenge, as far as I can see, for Osborne is how you connect up places like Wigan and Bolton to the Manchester city centre in order that people can get there to work, But actually, if we were seriously thinking about the disconnect between towns and cities, between the middle and working classes, we would be thinking about how you actually rebuild those areas, not just warehousing minimum wage jobs for young people, but actually how you rebuild the sort of social and cultural and economic life in those areas. And I'll just give you one example of that in my own area. So Wigan is a, a former mining community, and um, when I talk to people about the past. You know, this isn't some sort of blue labour, everything's rose-tinted, everything's wonderful. I think you would be hard-pressed to find anybody in Wigan who is rose-tinted about what mining was actually like. It was dangerous, it was difficult, and it was dirty work. But it was also stable, it was secure, 
it gave you a, a, a guaranteed wage and it gave you dignity and status in the community. And after work, once you got cleaned up, you would go down to the local labour club and you would have a pint or six with you know, your friends and your neighbours and the rest of your community. And there was a rhythm to that life. The, the Labour Club, the, one of the last Labour Clubs in Wigan, we ha still have a few left, but Upper Morris Street Working Men's Club stood right in the heart of my constituency and it was my headquarters for my election campaign in 2010. But it was in truth, it was already in decline. And now that Working Men's Club has been demolished and there's a McDonald's standing on that site. And it employs young people, minimum wage, zero hours jobs. And there is a story there, I think, about what has been lost and why people felt such a burning sense of anger around the EU referendum. You know, the people that I met who felt most strongly about leaving the European Union, who shook with anger when I spoke to them in workplaces and on doorsteps, were not people who had nothing left to lose. In those areas, frankly, they didn't really care one way or another. It was irrelevant. But it was in areas where... They'd seen things get worse over the past few decades, where they'd seen things that really, really mattered in their lives. Security, hope about the future, opportunities for their children. They'd seen that get harder and harder and harder and life get more and more of a struggle. And for a lot of those people, I think this was their last chance, they felt, to get us to sit up and take notice. And um, they were right, because they did. You know, the outcome of this referendum has absolutely shaken Westminster and Whitehall in a way that I couldn't have predicted a few years ago. Now, I, I think this is a problem for the left. It's clearly a problem for Labour. We are, we are pulled in two different directions by constituencies and constituents who share our Labour values but voted different ways in this referendum. But I think it also puts Labour in a unique position in British politics because when I look across... At, what, at the vision that May, and shared to some extent by Farage and Nuttall, has for Britain, it's not what I think people were voting for. They were voting for more control, more security, not less. They were voting against the ability of big corporations to come in and drive down terms and conditions and make life feel less stable and globalisation to be able to sweep away those shared institutions that matter to people. So they can't speak for those, those people, they can't speak for those voters. But neither do I think that the Greens or the Liberal Democrats can speak for those people because they have very clearly chosen a side. Rather than try and heal those divisions, they have nailed their colours to one side and one side alone and refused to hear what the rest of the country is telling them. Now, that is, it's a huge responsibility for Labour, but it is also an opportunity. That source of division within the party is also probably our greatest hope. Now, you mentioned, um, obviously, that story of the decline in your constituency, the, the, that very good example of the Working Men's Club becoming a McDonald's. Are there any examples of renewal that actually can give you hope in terms of Labour policy, particularly given that we have got these metro elections coming up in Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, and, and that's a, <laughs> a chance for Labour to prove that it's actually got an alternative agenda and maybe can be competent at governing? Yeah, so uh, until, uh, gosh, when was it? It was less than a year ago. It's been a long year in politics. Uh, but until um, June last year, I was Labour's spokesperson on energy and climate change. <laughs> and as part of that, I wanted to try and bridge what I think is a similar cause, <coughs> a gulf in in Labour, and that was around the debate about clean energy, about how we transition from being a country that has been powered by many of my constituents over the last 100 years through fossil fuels, through to being an energy system and an economy that is driven by clean energy. And it's a great big challenge for this country, it's a challenge for every country, one that so far we are spectacularly failing to meet, both in terms of meeting those climate change commitments and also in terms of creating those jobs and opportunities for young people across this country. And I wanted to try and understand why when you speak to so many Labour supporters and voters, so many people out in the country, climate change to them so often means losing a job or an energy bill going up. Um, 
And yet, when I speak to a lot of my friends and my colleagues, especially in London, but not exclusively in London, but particularly in the cities, climate change is, you know, it's a, it's a huge priority, it's a campaign, it's a, it's a value-based ideal that drives a lot of their politics. They feel very positive about the move to clean energy in a way that a lot of people in the out there in the country, and particularly in towns, don't. And a similar sort of cause, really. And I wanted to work out, is there a way that we can bring these two sides together? Because very similarly to Brexit, I feel there are shared values there, shared concerns and a shared agenda about the future of the country. And actually, the way that I saw that happening best was at a local and regional level. There are Labour councils across the country who are uh, powering their own communities through clean energy. And they're not just doing it in order to clean up the environment, although that's very important. They're also doing it in order to create jobs and opportunities for young people in those areas. And what's more, by doing it, sometimes very often deliberately, they're putting power actual real political power, power over lives back into people's hands. So from Hackney, where they've got, uh, they helped um, a huge council estate to set up solar panels on their roofs, and they've got young people from the estate employed as apprentices, and they've got a community trust that actually runs that and reinvests the money back in the estate and cuts their energy bills. Uh, from there to Oldham, where they went door to door and did a collective switch, where they used that mass purchasing power to switch to clean energy, but also to, uh, to put money back into the pockets of people who had virtually none. And what all this has done throughout the country, Nottingham, for example, Nottingham City Council set up their own energy company. They call it Robin Hood. <laughs> you can sort of tell what they're doing with that. You know, people like me who would pay a bit more to buy local and help people in the local area and go green are paying a bit more to help people who can't and cut their bills and clean up the city. It's exciting stuff because it is political in the real sort of power sense of the word. And I think that's the clue to Labour's renewal, actually. So I, I think um, one of the things that I learned when I was working in the voluntary sector under the last Labour government is that real meaningful change that lasts, change that Cameron couldn't come in and destroy in 2010, only happens when people own it and shape it and deliver it for themselves. I learned that from you know, the collective to the individual, the, the homeless teenager. We never turn those kids' lives around. They turn their own lives around, but they did it with our help. And um, in, in, in around 2008, I was still working in the voluntary sector, and it was around the time when David Cameron really started talking about the big society. And I have to say that although I was incredibly sceptical about the Conservatives' ability to deliver that agenda, the idea that people collectively together have the power to transform their own lives was really exciting. It should have always been a Labour idea. And I think this is the clue to the renewal of our towns and cities. I think this is the clue actually to the renewal of our politics. I don't mean that everyone has to go and run their own hospital. I mean, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't know how to and I don't really want to. But what I mean is where does power lie in Britain? That's the thing that unites the Labour Party if only we could see it and really understand it. We don't just believe in redistributing wealth. We believe in redistributing power and we seem to have forgotten that. But that is the thing, that is the corrosive force, the concentration of power in this country that I think is undermining my constituents' lives and the lives of people in communities like mine. And that's what Labour needs to fix. And do you think something like the National Citizen Service as well could have been a Labour idea? It's a Cameron idea. Now, a lot of people sneered at it as being a kind of, you know, a, a modern version of national service. It clearly isn't. Uh, I mean, my teenage son's very excited about the idea of being with other people, completely different walks of life, getting into that. Is that some, another area where Labour kind of missed the trick a bit on the narrative of it? No, I don't think so, because um, actually the precursor to the National Citizen Service was V that Gordon Brown set up. And so you, even I don't know what V is. Well, that's because you're too old. <laughs> but <laughs> That is true, Lisa. But, but basically, it stands for volunteering, I think. I mean, that's what it was always all about. It was about getting involved. And um, I worked with a lot of young people who went through that scheme. And I've worked with a lot of young people. I represent a lot of young people who've been through NCS. And uh, I would say that the enthusiasm and the excitement is equal, actually. There was... 
at the beginning of NCS, there was much more of a sort of framework around it. It was the big society. It was the original sort of Jesse Norman approach about, you know, shared institutions and building a lifelong culture of involvement and engagement. I think what I really feel about NCS is that it's a good, it's a good thing to do and it's one of the few things in the end that they protected and kept funding for young people. So it's, it's not to be knocked from that point of view. But actually, I think, I think involvement and engagement in civic life has to start a lot earlier. So we, you know, we had uh, um, you know, citizenship education when we were in government. We introduced that. But actually, I think there's something much more exciting that you can do with young people. I've seen it for myself, actually, in my own constituency. UNICEF run a programme called Rights Respecting Schools. Um, this is going to sound a bit, if you've never seen it, it sounds a bit odd, but trust me, it's great. Um, so they, in primary schools, they will teach young people to hold power and responsibility from a very, very young age. So I have sat in an assembly and watched five-year-olds collectively making decisions about things that happen in their school, whether it's, you know, classroom rules, playground rules, whether it's how extra money that the school has just raised is spent. And, you know, of course, you know, most of the kids will want a roller coaster when you start. Mm. But by the time they finish, they've made some shared decisions that are of mutual benefit to everybody in the school. And it's amazing to watch those young people then grow in confidence and expectation that about the, not just the, 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 you know, the opportunities that come with power, but about the responsibility that comes with it as well. And if we're serious about equipping young people for the future, I don't think we can just do a summer school with them. In fact, the NCS was never intended to just be that. It has to be a, a different ethos about who holds power in this country. And, you know, before I was elected to Parliament, I worked with children and young people, and they do know, actually a lot of the answers about their own lives. They, th there has to be support in order to help realise that. And it is also a process of learning and education for them. But actually, they are capable of holding power. And it's exciting to watch it when it happens. Um, power has obviously been uh, extended across the Labour Party and in its own structure, thanks to the changes implemented by uh, Ed Miliband in the wake of Falkirk. Um, now, to what extent do you think the Labour politics, the way Labour does politics, has changed under Corbyn, both locally and nationally? Do you, I mean, in your constituency, how many new members have you got, for example? Have you got a huge number? Yeah. We've and, and do they get involved? Some, yeah. So we've, we've doubled our membership um, since Jeremy won, and some of those members have got involved. Um, in, in the traditional things that we do, whether it's, you know, meetings or fundraisers or knocking on doors or street stalls. So we've had, we've had a few come out and help. And actually, that is, that, is a, that is a very positive thing. So I know there's been a you know, huge debate about do any of these people actually do anything, but actually stepping over that threshold from being a member of a political party into being an active member of a political party is quite a difficult thing to do. It's quite a daunting thing to do usually I think only done with encouragement from existing members so I think it has been positive and it has been very heartening. If I'm really honest I don't think that much has changed very much in the way that Labour does its politics though. I mean at, at grassroots level actually I think we were always a bit better than we're given credit for. If you go to Wigan and you walk into the library on a Saturday you will see Labour Party members running the local credit union teaching art classes, volunteering at the food bank. We are active and we are involved in the community, although it's true not always under the Labour banner, but often we are. Um, the trouble is that it hasn't really connected up with what's happening nationally. So, you know, in towns like Wigan, I think we do have a lot to say about what the Labour Party's direction of travel should be, but it's not always heard. And we are getting a bit better, I think, at hearing local government leaders. But it is still very, very concentrated around the cities. Um, so when I uh, recently I, I started looking at the difference in mood and opinion and, and attitudes between towns and cities in Britain, and I spoke to the LGA Labour Group about 
um, you know, where is the voice for towns? And at the moment, there isn't one. So there's a cities group, but not a towns group. And that tells you that we need to sort that out. Yeah. And um, do you think the national leadership are, are gripped of that? I mean, do they get it? So I think it's a cultural thing as much as anything else. Um, I think for a very long time, Labour's been... The conversation in Labour shrunk. Um, we went through an era that felt very much like in politics, like uh, we were pulling control into the centre. You know, the, 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 the great initiatives that you might think of under the last Labour government were very much about, you know, big spending commitments from national government. Now, I'm not knocking that. Actually, in my constituency, that meant saved lives. That meant people not, you know, stacked up in uh, corridors, in hospitals, on um, trolleys waiting to be seen. It meant, you know, not queues of ambulances. It meant better schools. It meant better teaching resources. It mattered. It did completely transform lives. But they were big central initiatives and they were often it seems from the outside, made by a very small number of people in a room. <coughs> and these are the things, the sure starts and so on, that then become very easy to dismantle when, uh, when you have a change of government and you have a change <laughs> of ideology that wants to shrink the state. Whereas the changes that were much harder to dismantle were the community energy schemes that had 300 local people signed up helping to fund it, helping to drive it, helping to manage it, or the education maintenance allowance, which was owned by and felt very personal to young people across the country. You know, thousands of them came out and marched on Whitehall, not for themselves, but for the kids who came after them, because it felt so important and so personal. It was theirs, and they owned it. And I think that is a lesson for Labour, really, about our, the, the cultural issues that we've got. Now, you mentioned both Sure Start and the sort of some of those things that Blair uh, introduced. And I won't go into the, you know, the uh, Monty Python style, what did New Labour ever do for us? Because um, you can reel off that and Tom Watson did that at conference. Um, but speaking of Blair, I want to ask you about this quote he came out with last year, which I think perhaps got to the heart of Labour's problem. He said, there are two types of politician on the left, and there always have been. There's the guy whose face is on the placard. That's me. Hate that guy. Jeremy's the guy with the placard, holding the placard. One's the politics of power, the other's the politics of protest. Where do you stand on that? Or do you just think, look, you can have both? Right, here we go. <laughs> Blair or Corbyn? No, um, it's the ideas. OK, the f okay, so I will answer this, right? But the first thing I'll say is this, that one of the really terrible things that I think has happened in the Labour Party over the last... 10, 20 years has been the sort of Americanization of the way that we do our politics. This sort of presidential style, the Labour Party is Tony Blair, the Labour Party is Jeremy Corbyn. I was really, really worried about it when it started emerging in the early 2000s about Tony Blair. There were some people who were so messianic about Tony Blair that actually it started to feel a bit like a cult. Now, I don't use these words lightly but this is a similar feeling that people who ended up on the other side of the Corbyn question got have got in the last couple of years as well and the truth is that we are not that in the Labour Party we are supposed to know that nothing worth doing in this country was ever achieved by one man or woman alone and that it's collectives that change things when you look at the you know one of the greatest things that happened under the last labor government that i think was genuinely transformative for the economy and for society it was the introduction of the national minimum wage and i remember growing up before we had a national minimum wage and everybody said it couldn't be done you know they said the sky would fall in they said business would collapse and it took a growing clamour of noise from outside Parliament and then some very, very good people, not many, inside Parliament in order to drive that change through and make it happen. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that there is a, there is a real need for Labour to articulate emotions and values. And if we forget to do that, then it finds only one outlet and that is the populist right or the radical left. And I think both of those things are a dead end for this country and for the world. The, there's an there's a academic called Will Davies who, um, he's at Goldsmiths at the moment, and he, um, 
he, he wrote a piece not very long ago in the New Statesman talking about, he called it the age of pain, that we're in this era of what feels like unprecedented private distress. And that is finding its expression in quite new ways through the public debate. And that that accounts for a lot of what we saw with Brexit and what we're seeing with Trump. Now, I think this is true. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's completely new, but I think the level that we're seeing it at is new. And the left has found itself almost unable to comprehend that. We think that we've accepted this idea that we're all rational, calculating human beings who will, you know, do questionnaires and think, well, Labour best fits my policies so therefore we want to vote for them and you know the 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 analyst ian warren wrote a piece recently about how labor is absolutely obsessed with policy and we think that we can just come up with all these policies and if people like them they're going to vote for them but and we forget actually about that and jeremy i think became almost the lightning rod for that sort of politics in the labor party members who are have been desperate to see more of that so where where i think blair's wrong is to dismiss that, you know, those values and that power of those, of articulating very clearly those values. But where I am really, really concerned about what is happening on the left of British politics, by which I mean the entirety of the progressive left, is that I think we are starting to be very much in danger of abandoning politics for protest. By politics, what I mean is a willingness to negotiate the shared challenges that we face. I think on the left, most of us came into politics in order to campaign, in order to stand up for certain values, in order to give voice to those values. I know I certainly did. Six years ago, that was exactly what I imagined that my entire parliamentary career would be, however long it lasted. I'd been a campaigner in the voluntary sector. I couldn't care more about giving a voice to some of the people who I'd worked with and who I now represented who hadn't had one. And one of my colleagues, Colin Bergen, who was an outgoing MP, said to me, this place is the best megaphone that you will ever have, so use it. It was a great piece of advice, and he was right. But it's not enough just to, to pick a side and shout, especially at the moment when the country feels, in my view, so needlessly divided. Our job isn't to pick up the placards. There are lots of great, brilliant, brave people out there on the streets doing that. Our job is to work out how to negotiate those shared challenges in the interests of the many. That is socialist politics to me. And so far, the direction of travel that I've seen on the left of British politics in response to Trump and Brexit has been the opposite. It's been to pick up the placards rather than to start thinking about the politics. From, you know, from the very bottom to the very top of political parties, I think that is our instinct. And I think it's a dangerous instinct because what it does is it condemns us to be witnesses to the pain and destruction that people like Donald Trump are causing to the world. And if we're ever going to change this, we are going to have to do... It's what John calls... For years, he's been talking to me about the intellectual heavy lifting, and I haven't had a clue what he means. <laughs> um, but actually, when was the last time that Labour or the progressive left more broadly sat down and thought very, very seriously about what, what, what do we stand for in 21st century Britain? What is our programme? What unites us? Not just what we're against. We know a lot about what we're against, but we, what are we actually for? And for me, this is the power agenda. And I think this is a... Perhaps it's a generational thing, not an age thing, but in Labour, I think there is a generation of politicians who came in between 2010 and now who are united in that. You know, it unites people from Liz Kendall to Clive Lewis in the Labour Party, and I think it's quite an important and quite an exciting agenda. But it's a break. It's a break from 1997. It's a break from the 1970s. And that's interesting because currently, as you say, most of the debate is about which policy you offer, which retail policy you're going to give the, the electorate. Now, they are important, obviously. Um, but you're talking about something much deeper. You're talking about um, a, a new way of doing politics, or at least trying to engage with all those challenges for the, on behalf of the left. Um, but when it comes down to it, when you're pitching to an electorate over several years, as John and Ed Miliband tried to, 
They did a lot of that diagnosis. They did a lot of the heavy lifting. And we saw the result in 2015. Now, is that not their fault? Was it for lots of other reasons? Was it no, there was no lack of intellectual heavy lifting? What was it that really made people tick in Nuneaton, Tory, rather than Labour? So, I don't know about Nuneaton, but I think there was a lot of that work that was done in those years. And actually, this shared agenda around power really started to find its expression and voice in the last parliament in Labour through that policy review and through a group that John set up. It was called, I think it was called One Nation, um, which makes me want to cry thinking about it. But it was, it brought together a, a, a huge range of Labour politicians who started seriously thinking about what that power agenda would look like. But, um, but then when we got to the election, it all just seemed to collapse into what I think John's called himself a retail offer to the electorate, or if you haven't, sorry to get you into trouble because I think that's what you called it to me. But it, you know, essentially, Frankie Boyle summed it up better, I think, than anyone else that I've seen. He basically said, you know, you've got Labour going door to door saying, look, give you three quid off your energy bill and eight hours more on your childcare. And he was like, you're meant to be a political party <laughs> with a vision for Britain, not a door-to-door -door salesman right. with a few things to flog. And actually, it felt like it. It didn't, it wasn't, we weren't connecting with people through that at all. It's partly about the Labour Party's obsession with policy, but it's also because actually the, the, the offer at the election had become very divorced from the work that had been done beforehand. So there's some really exciting thinking going on in this area at the moment about you know spheres of, of justice, spheres of inequality, about how you make sure that inequality in one area, for example, like uh, income, doesn't then compound and cement inequality in another area like education. This is the sort of thinking that has been going on behind the scenes in Labour for some time, but has not been connected in any meaningful sense to what we're communicating to the wider public. And that, I think, is the task for, for this leader and you know, anybody who wants to play a part in Labour's future. And isn't it a bit of an indictment that actually one of the best ideas that seems to have come out recently was from former Tony Blair advisor Simon Stevens, who now runs the NHS, who said in a select committee just um, a few weeks ago that actually <coughs> the, one of the solutions to the social care crisis, which Labour's going to have to grapple and come up with an answer on, just as much as the government is. One of the solutions is thinking about not a guaranteed state pension, but guaranteed holistic approach to housing, to care and to income. Um, and you're seeing there the sort of beginnings of a big idea. And how come it's left to someone like Simon Stevens or the Labour Party to come up with something like that? Well, I th because honestly, I think good ideas come from everywhere. And actually, one of the dangers of being in opposition is that you start to close your ears to that. So Estelle Morris said years ago that one of the problems with opposition is that when you're in government, you have this, you have people banging on your door constantly. Everybody needs to talk to you and you have to listen because you represent the entire country. Trouble with opposition is that that banging, after a while, it stops. And you are in danger then of only speaking to people who agree with you and the conversation shrinks and narrows. And that's part of what John and Steve Reid and I and many local government leaders have been trying to do through this organisation that we set up called Labour Together, is to expand that conversation to groups like this, to faith communities, to, to communities outside of Westminster and Whitehall and to local government as well, in order to try and hear that. But I think... Also, there has to be a common thread that runs through it. So, f I know I keep returning to this theme about power, but I really think this is important. One of the problems for Labour in recent years, I think, is that we've allowed, we've allowed the interests of the middle classes to be pitted against the interests of the working classes. And I see this quite a lot. And, you know, when I talk about the disconnect between towns and cities, between metropolitan liberals and, and the working classes in towns, 
one of the solutions to this, I think, is that Labour has to find a way to knit those interests back together. Now, I don't think it's as hard as we seem to make it, to be honest, because I think those interests are knitted together. It's just that the systems that we have constantly pit those two groups of people against one another. The best example I can think of, the one where we so obviously get ourselves into a mess all the time, is around strikes. So every time there is a strike in Britain, the, the phone call goes into the leader of the opposition's office, are you supporting this strike or not? When it was Ed, there would be lots of debate about it. When it's Jeremy, it's fairly straightforward. <laughs> but actually, there is a problem here, wherever you end up on this question, which is that our response has only ever been to pick a side. When actually, when I look at, when I look at the most recent strikes, for example, on public transport, essentially, you have a group of people who are working in the private sector largely, who are probably quite low paid and whose jobs are probably pretty insecure, who are simply trying to get to work. They've probably paid a lot of money to do it and they might get fired if they don't. And you've got their interests being pitted against a group of people in the public sector who are probably quite low paid, their jobs are pretty insecure and they're standing up for their rights not to be treated like that. How is it then that Labour's response is that we pick one side or another and ignore the fact that it's the system that is at fault and that needs to be changed. I think social security is another example. I won't give you loads, but I'll just give you this one. We are constantly arguing in Parliament about who should be a priority for social security. So often what ends up happening is that you have the middle classes who are struggling to get by. You know, Theresa May calls them the jams, Ed called them the squeeze middle. But this is the group actually that I felt were so angry about Brexit and wanted to use it as a way to shake us up and listen. And they, we are constantly arguing about whether they, de they are more deserving of tax credits to help life be more bearable than a group of people who have virtually nothing who are absolutely struggling to live with dignity and manage from day to day, who are on sickness benefit or an employment benefit or so on. And we, you know, we simply say, well, we can't afford both. So we have a huge argument about who is more deserving of help. But actually, we've got an economy that doesn't distribute the, the, the rewards of wealth properly. And so we le our welfare state is fairly unique in Europe in the amount of heavy lifting that it has to do. Why is Labour trying to pick one side over another and neglecting the fact that it's the system at fault? And this is what I mean about power and where power lies, and that's why I think that is the future for Labour. Is one of the, the problems with that that we're living in, for good or ill, in an age of austerity, and that even if there were a Labour government, it would have to be you know, looking after the pennies? Um, and that you're going to have to make these hard choices, and whether it's rationing in healthcare or whether it's those tough choices in, in welfare, um, is that inevitable? Or are you saying, look, this just needs a, a rethink, a deep rethink on the way we structure it all completely you yeah, can, uh, yeah. within budgets? So I'm saying the latter. Um, but, here's the but. I think that the sort of vision that I'm describing is expensive. So one of the problems with the big society is that it started, I think, in its inception, probably before Cameron got hold of it, as quite a radical agenda about empowering people to make more decisions around their own lives. Now, the problem is that that then coincided with both an ideology and a political reality around public finances that meant that the size of the state shrunk dramatically. There are a lot of people in our party who I think were very attracted by the idea that communities could do more for themselves. But actually, if you genuinely want people across the country to hold more power, if you want to break those sort of spheres of inequality, then to do so, you have to finance it. It does cost money. The state has to walk alongside people as a partner. And we don't just have an inequality in wealth in this country and assets economic assets within communities. We also have huge barriers that we have to help people overcome in order to be able to have more control over their own lives, whether it's skills or confidence or education or time. Um, you know, it's a nonsense to suggest that most of my constituents could 
get more involved in making community decisions when many of them are working two or three jobs just to make ends meet and trying to find time to spend with their children as well. So this does cost money. There's no question about it. But actually, this fundamental overhaul of the way that we do things in this country, I think it has to come. I spoke to it. It was a former member of the Shadow Cabinet in the last Parliament um, a few years ago when he was feeling particularly disheartened about the collapse of this agenda within Labour. It felt like a very exciting time that we were really thinking about how we help to empower people around the country to start to take control of things. And then it seemed to, as we got closer and closer to an election, it seemed to, to disappear or to be squeezed or, or, you know, to be replaced by this very transactional sort of politics. And that, I remember saying to him at the time, I think this will happen because it has to happen, because frankly the current settlement is unsustainable. Now I didn't predict then when you fast forward to 2017 that we'd be here, but it is, it's felt unsustainable for an incredibly long time. It's palpable in communities like mine. It just, we can't, you know, to, to nick a phrase, we can't go on like this. And because it will be expensive, have you got your head round, you know, would that involve being straight with people and saying more in terms of taxes or does it mean, you know, radical uh, tax hikes on, on the wealthy? I mean, how, how do you fund that kind of vision? So, uh, I think um, one example, for example, of this is unearned wealth. So <coughs> I've watched as we've taxed working people more and more and more and they've seen their income squeezed more and more and more, whether that's through income tax, whether that's through VAT, whether that's through... Um, council tax, which actually is really, really difficult for a lot of my constituents, but then not seeing that same level of commitment put into how we tax unearned wealth. And so not only then do you put more and more strain on people who can least afford to bear it, but you cement those power inequalities in the country as well. So I think there are much more imaginative and important things that we can do around taxation, but I think taxation is part of it. The, the other thing that I would say is that I think this does require some quite big thinking. It, it feels very radical, but actually it's, it's more a, a questioning of where we are as a country and why we've made the choices that we've made, something that I don't feel has fundamentally really happened in the course of my lifetime. So Joseph Stiglitz, Stig, Stiglitz for example, he, you know, he poses the question in one of his essays about what, it would look like if instead of restricting movement of labour, we restricted movement of capital. And then, so work, you know, companies would compete to attract workers. Mm. They would probably compete not just in terms of wages, but in terms of low taxation on those workers. Capital would most likely pick up the slack and pay, pay those taxes instead. And, uh, you know, the, the suddenly the political landscape looks completely transformed. And it feels very like a bolt out of the blue when you start to think about those very fundamental ways that we've structured society. And part of the reason that I think it's not just a pipe dream for people on the left who'd like to imagine that another world is possible is because this is the sort of thing that I was hearing from people in places like Wigan and Sunderland in working men's clubs and factories during the EU referendum. People were saying to me, essentially, we cannot understand how Labour has come to be on the side of capital rather than Labour. It was, they were expressing it in lots of different ways, but the sentiment was quite often the same. And free movement has become this horribly sort of um, uh, values-based issue in the Labour Party. And that what I mean is that too much of the debate recently internally has been people wearing their issues like a badge. Never mind debating the pros and cons of nuclear power. Let's wear the issue like a badge to signal whether we sit on the right or left of the Labour Party. And I feel that free movement has become one of those issues. You know, I am... I am very liberal in my outlook around immigration. I spent years working with refugee and migrant families before I came into Parliament and fighting for their rights, and I'll continue to do so. And I am really, really proud that we as a country are able to attract great people to come in and work in our hospitals and pioneer research in our universities and contribute to our cultural life and, and change it for the better. 
But I also feel very, very angry, like many of my constituents, that that system of free movement has allowed us to ignore the skills and the aspirations of young people in towns like mine for a very long time. There was a week during the EU referendum when there was a Labour politician who went onto the TV and said something that actually a lot of, a lot of politicians said during the campaign. You know, you're more likely to be... Uh, treated by a migrant in the NHS than queuing behind one. And somebody said to me in Wigan, well, why should I be grateful that we can attract people to come here and work in these hospitals when you've just abolished the nursery and bursary and I have not got a hope of getting a job in that hospital now, so thanks very much. And actually, if you look at the opportunities for young people in towns like mine over the years, We've abolished the EMA, we've abolished AIM Higher, we've ended free university education, we've got rid of nursing bursaries, we've got rid of the career service. Where are these opportunities now? And it, essentially what they were saying to me is it's allowed a, a skilled and mobile population across Europe to gain advantage at the expense of the rest of us. And that is no different, by the way, than what young people told me in Germany and what I've heard from young people in France what apparently some politicians who came over recently were telling me young people were saying in Holland. These are shared concerns, global concerns, that Labour has to address. They want to know who's speaking for them, and I think we ought to. And that brings me on to the, the Ian Warren point you made about, you know, it's not all about individual policies that Labour needs to obsess about, as it tends to. It's about a, a deeper cultural uh, connection with people. One part of that is patriotism and, you know, flag and country. I know John's written about this quite a lot. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, often, isn't it the case that in Brexit, a lot of people who'd say they, the one thing they'd left, that had left in their community, they used to be proud of the, the job down the mine, they used to be proud of various things in their local community. The one thing they could be proud of was the, was the Union Jack. Uh, how does Labour deal with that amongst its own voters? So, as it happens, I gave a lecture on this. Um, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> you've obviously been following it. I haven't. Um, so I went and gave a lecture to uh, a think tank called CLASS, which is run by a group of trade unions. Um, it was set up a few years ago to sort of help reinvigorate the debate around class politics. And... I went and gave a lecture about it just before the general election because I think that patriotism is one of the, the ideas and the concepts that we have allowed to become the exclusive property of the right in British politics. And I find it very, it, certainly in terms of patriotism, by which I mean something different to nationalism, I find that very hard to understand because that sense of pride, collective pride, whether it's in your community or your region or your country, is something that ought to be something very comfortable for the left. We believe in solidarity, we believe in ideals. We should, be, we should understand the sentiment that sends people off to fight for their country, even if we'd rather that young people were living for their country rather than dying for their country, we should understand the pride and the patriotism and the sentiment that lies behind it. It's that need for, for collective belonging, to be part of something bigger than yourself. It's a very, very human need, and it is a great response to the right and their individualistic values. But I think we've just allowed the debate to narrow so much, and we've ceded so much of the ground. And I, I don't just feel it in relation to to concepts and ideas. I feel it too that it's seeped into our language. So one of the things that Labour talks about a lot, I mean, I do too, to be honest, because it affects a lot of my constituents, is the bedroom tax. But the phrasing of the bedroom tax really worries me. We, because essentially what we're doing is we are equating a, 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 a policy that I genuinely believe is actually fundamentally immoral with tax. But when was tax for people on the left of British politics a fundamentally, intrinsically bad thing? Pe playing your part, paying your share, supporting other people. And I hear it all the time in the language that we use in, in politics, is that we don't just talk about the bedroom tax, we talk about tax relief. We are 
reinforcing the frames that the right has drawn for us. And in doing so, we're not just helping to cement and create the mood music in which we operate, which makes it even more difficult to do anything other than to be defensive and react to the onslaught of right-wing ideas that are thrown at us. But we do something more damaging, I think, and that is that we, we begin to chip away at people's belief that things can be different and that they can be better, and we erode hope. So we, it isn't just about our concepts and our ideas, it's also about the way that we present those and to be much more thoughtful and much more careful and to develop a language on the left of British politics that is emotive, that is appealing, that starts from where people are and that reflects properly our values. And given that Labour's current problem on the immediate horizon is Copeland and Stoke, the by-elections, yeah. um, first I wanted to ask you, have you been up and done your bit? In not of those not yet. yet, but I mean, I'm going. The whips I'm are insisting. At, yeah, no, I'm looking at Luke. He <laughs> fixed me a, a, de a couple of dates to go. Um, and we, if anyone's interested, we have got a phone bank running as well every day <laughs> in the evening. If you'd all like to come and help, because <laughs> I'd imagine that in both those seats, you, you'd confront a lot of the things you've just been talking about. Um, and yet, in both those seats, the message that seems to be coming back from some of your activists is that the blunt fact is that working class traditional Labour voters are saying on the doorstep, I'm not voting for that bloke because he doesn't sing the national anthem. I'm not voting for that bloke because he wants to remove my job down the shipyard. Or I'm not voting for that bloke because he doesn't believe in a new power station. Um, how, that's the raw front line you're dealing with. How do you cope with it given everything? How do you implement what you've just been saying for the last 40 minutes in that context? On the doorstep. With a leader like that. Well, I suppose what I would say is that people grumbling about the leader of the Labour Party on the doorstep isn't that new. It didn't, <laughs> how can I say this diplomatically? It didn't start with Jeremy Corbyn. This is not a, a new phenomenon. I've been knocking on doors since I was... I think I delivered my first Labour Party leaflet when I was about seven. And there have been quite a lot of comments about most Labour Party leaders, especially in the last eight or so years. So um, I think that's the first thing to say. The second thing is actually that there is the, the bigger issue actually on the doorstep for Labour is that people don't know what we stand for. And I think that is a consequence of us being much more interested in talking about the things that we're against. And in the last parliament, I think that we did a pretty good job of being an opposition um, and actually, you know, looking at what Keir Starmer and the Brexit team are doing in the, in the House of Commons chamber today, I think we're doing a good job in opposing that too. But the, the real challenge for Labour is to become the alternative. And that means you have to know not just what you're against, but what you're for. And I, I think that we... I think that we, in some ways, we've overcomplicated it in that... I look at the row about Brexit that is taking place in the House of Commons chamber right now and in the country, and there are certainly values at stake. I, you know, I went around the country campaigning in the referendum, and in my view, I'm one of a minority of people, I think, in this country on either side who feels very, very passionately one way or another. But for most people, I think this was quite a finely balanced decision. And actually... In most of the households that I met then and that I met on Saturday when I was door knocking in my own constituency, it pitted grandparents against grandchildren. It divided husbands from wives. My street where I live in Wigan all voted differently. The households voting, my next door neighbour voted differently to me and had quite a lot to say to me about why. <laughs> and... Um, they're not scrapping it out. They're not fighting. They're not refusing to listen to one another. Most people's view that I meet in Wigan is we just need to get on with it, don't we? We need to work out what comes next. And the longer that... Somebody said to me on the doorstep on Saturday, the longer that you keep arguing about this, the less time we've got to actually work out what to do. And we had that debate, so why are you still having it? And I... I just feel, actually, sometimes in Labour, we do overcomplicate it. What matters to people in their everyday lives? It's your family, it's your friends, it's your home and it's where you live. 
and it's your sense of hope about the future and the opportunities that will be for your kids. Maybe people have some other priorities, but I think largely we all care pretty much about the same things. And we've moved quite far away from that, I think, in the last few years on the left. And I think that we need to go back and start there. In a way, I think this is a bit about respecting people. That too many people tell me when I go out and knock on doors around the country that they think that on the left, we think that we know better than they do. And actually, it's not good enough for us to go and tell them that the real issue that they need to be concerned about is free movement and the single market or energy bills or anything else. A bit more listening and a bit less talking, I think, is in order. And finally, um, and then we can open up to questions. Um, Neil Lawson of Compass, I mean, obviously, Compass like you, a lot of different political groups like you, um, even progress these days, I hear. Um, that's that's Get quite me a feat. Um, Neil Lawson wrote in a, in a pamphlet a while back that the wrong people were voting Labour in yeah. the Blair and Brown years. He was mercilessly mocked for it, I think, to remember do, by. Is there any defence for that media. statement? Well, in his defence, I don't think that he quite meant it like that. Um, I think what he meant when I read the article was that we, there were a group of people for whom we had stopped speaking and that was about to become a real problem for Labour. And if you look at it in that context, he was absolutely right. Uh, the left behinds are now a, it's now a sort of buzzed phrase in, in British politics. But, but actually... My politics is, uh, like Neil's, I think, very pluralist. I'm interested in what I can learn from other people. And I might not always agree with them, but I think usually the challenge that they provide, even if fundamentally I don't share any of their values, is important and helpful to me and to Labour in helping to develop our politics. It's one of the reasons that I wrote a book with Caroline Lucas and a Lib Dem called Chris Bowers last year about, um, we called it the alternative, which sounds very grand, but about cooperation amongst the what we loosely called the progressive politicians on the left of British politics. It's not because I think that we should all suddenly go into government together or merge or you know stop arguing with each other. It's actually because I think that the challenge we provide to each other on the left of British politics is really important. I think when the Lib Dems challenge Labour about <coughs> our sometimes casual attitude on civil liberties, it's important and it's helpful. Just as I think when Labour challenges the Liberal Democrats about their sometimes casual attitude about economic freedom, that that is helpful and important as well. And Actually, I think this is probably the big divide that is opening up in British politics at the moment uh, between people who want to negotiate the future and people who want to impose it. And on that, I think I probably agree completely with Neil. And does that progressive alliance include centre-right Tory voters, the kind of people that you're going to need to win an election? So the Fabians... Or is it a politics of despair, as some people have called it? Yeah, the, uh, the, the desperados. Yeah. Uh, I think it's um, a recognition, actually, that um, the, the future does belong to politicians who can learn from and work with other people and draw on different influences. Look, I look at my political party, and I think that we have always been a very broad church in terms of political opinion. And, you know, there are some that would say now and different group of people who said in the, the uh, late 90s, 2000s, the, the thing for Labour to do is just get behind your leader and fall into line and read off the script and vote with the whip. Now, party cohesion and unity matters and you have to find a way to come to a shared political programme that you can put to the electorate and you have to have a shared set of values in common. But actually, the idea that we would stop debating and challenging with one another, I think this is exactly the wrong direction of travel for political parties. Even just since I left university, the world has changed completely in terms of the way that we deba debate. You know, I will debate with people over social media while I'm sitting on a bus. Um, I recently, Clive Lewis and Johnny Reynolds and I uh, wrote a piece um, 
calling on the party to consider not standing a candidate in Richmond, which caused all, you know, mm -hmm. all hell broke loose. Actually, we were... We negotiated that piece between us and wrote it between us. I don't know where they were, but I was on my smartphone travelling to a meeting with John, actually, while we were doing it. We're, we're constantly communicating with other people. We're constantly having to conduct political debate out in the open. And I think it's a really good thing. Politics is not black and white. The issues that I deal with most of the time, the answers are in shades of grey. And we're not right all the time. And so being able to have that very adult, open conversation with the electorate that says we don't necessarily have all the answers, but let's have the debate and let's come to the right conclusion in the interests of the country, I think people are desperate for it. I don't think they want more scripts. I don't think they want more politicians who claim to be able to fix everything, really, in the end, because it doesn't stack up, it doesn't work. So we have to be prepared to listen to other people. And what's more, we have to believe that we can win people over too. So the Fabians did this bit of research that was really stark about the number of people that Labour is going to have to win over if we're going to win an election, even by a majority of one, and particularly highlighted that in some of the key marginals that we are going to have to win over serious, serious numbers of people who didn't just vote Conservative last time but the time before. But I believe that it can be done. I think this is actually the real definition of what it means to be radical is that and progressive is that you believe that people are open to change you believe in the best of people you believe that you know if you can debate with people and you can convince them and you can win them over that the world can get better you don't pick a side and you don't demonize the other side there's no future for britain in that and that it's a challenge for the left but it's a challenge for politicians as a whole and I, I think that is the big divide opening up in Labour and in British politics, is between people who think that pluralism is the future and between others who believe that we can cling to some of those models that we had in the past. Great. That's a great note to end our bit on. Um, now, forgive me for going on too long and asking Lisa too many questions, but let's open it out now. Um, this chap here. Okay, crikey. I think you answered that in <laughs> somewhere around the middle. Um, okay, so the first first one on the on the economy, I think that that uh, mantra that the Tories kept repeating about you didn't fix the roof while the sun was shining and wasting public money was enormously powerful. I don't know what John thinks, but I felt knocking on doors that it grew and it grew and it grew. 
and at times we were not challenging it robustly and at other times we were helping to reinforce that with our own narrative uh, and that was really that was really damaging for labor but i think there's something bigger going on actually that labor needs to overcome about the economy and that is that there's a reason i think why george osborne turned the attack in the second parliament from Labour wasted all your money and were reckless with public finance to Labour are a threat to your security. And that is because pe people already felt that we were careless about their economic security. And the more that we would talk about spending commitments, the more it would help to reinforce that narrative. But then when you add on to that, some of the things that have happened very recently, you know, the rows about Trident, the endless rows about Trident, for example, and defence spending. Uh, the, you know, there was a, an episode around the shooting at the Bataclan where it was spun, although to be fair, he didn't, he didn't say this, but it was spun that Jeremy was saying that those officers shouldn't have shot and killed people who were shooting and killing innocent people in a nightclub. He wasn't saying that, but it, the trouble is that all of these things have been used to drive a narrative that at times we really haven't helped that says that Labour is careless about your security, your economic security, your energy security, your national security. And I think that's a bigger problem for Labour, actually. I think that's a real deep emotive thing for people, because in the end, you're essentially saying to people, trust us to go off and make the right decisions over lots of things, you know, we don't know what's going to come up in the next five years. Trust us to make the right decision about when and how to go to war. And if people feel that we're careless about some of the most important things in their lives, their security, then we're never going to be able to fix it. So the economy matters, but it's part of a bigger whole, actually, that I think we need to get to grips with. Uh, second bit of the question uh, about the welfare state and the you know, a lot of the achievements that Labour had um, and how do we remind people about that and how that a lot of that has been destroyed in the last few years. I think we're probably doing a, a, a better job, actually, at local level and with the cuts to local councils than perhaps we're doing nationally. So recently, especially over winter, the A&E has been in... Uh, the A&E, the NHS has been in serious crisis and A&E's even in towns like mine where the hospital is particularly well run and outperforms others has been really struggling and w i think we have been very good at highlighting to people that a large portion of that chaos and crisis is being caused by cuts to social care and i think also people are feeling that in their own everyday lives there's a bigger challenge i think to highlight what's happening to people who are the most disadvantaged in this country because people simply don't see it and that i suppose is why i believe one of the reasons i believe very strongly that the future for labor can't lie in allowing the interests of people who have virtually nothing to be pitted against the interests of people who increasingly have less and less because most people don't live their lives out campaigning every day or volunteering in their local food bank. They're going to work, they're looking after their families. And I think it is too much to expect them to be acutely aware of the people who come to my surgery every Friday afternoon and Monday morning and sit in tears telling me that they cannot go on and they cannot survive and they have no hope for the future. And equally, I think it's wrong for Labour to expect that just by talking about those issues that we can win a general election because we have to address both that which we feel a burning sense of injustice about and things that are going on in other people's lives who live very different lives to that even if it's even if it's on the same doorstep and finally I would just say this and then I'll, I will shut up and let you ask some more questions but one of the ways in which we've helped to bridge that gap previously has been through shared institutions and I haven't said anything about shared institutions but actually it was one of the things that made me sit up and listen to the work that Jesse Norman did on the big society in the first place because 
Those shared institutions is traditionally in my community where we did come together and negotiate our interests and our challenges in the interests of the many. And they have, they've been sold off and they've been closed down and they have declined and they've been transformed beyond any recognition. The local library, the working man's club, Northern Rock that Maurice and John have talked a lot about, that sense of civic life was often built around and based on those institutions and brought people together. And increasingly now we live these atomistic, individualistic lives where we seek out people who are like us and like-minded to us through social media. And I think this is really dangerous for society, but I also think it's a particular problem for the left because we believe in collectives, we believe in a co rich collective life, we believe in reciprocity, we believe in shared endeavour and yet we haven't invested in building that shared civic life and that is the only way in the end that I think that we're going to solve it. Another question. Check there in the middle. Yep. Hi, uh, So I've spent, um, I've spent the last few years saying that to people in Wigan and Middlesbrough, Sunderland, Stoke and around the country. I spent most of the six months in the run-up to the EU referendum out on the road uh, in those sorts of communities, um, particularly where people have traditionally voted Labour for a long time, have a history of solidarity and activism. Um, and um, felt very, very strongly in large part that they wanted to leave the European Union. And I went to those communities in order to make the case for Remain and did so. I do still believe that it is not in Britain's interest to leave the European Union. I think it would have been far preferable had we voted to Remain. But I was one of many MPs who voted in favour of delegating that decision to the British public, not without misgivings, I have to say, and I didn't ever think that the way that the referendum campaign was then conducted would have been that poor. But I voted to delegate that decision, and in all honesty, I think the decision is made. So we, are, we had a huge public debate. I, don't, I never, ever got a sense when I visited those communities and listened to what people had to say that people were too stupid to understand the question or that the driver behind the vast, vast majority of people who were voting leave was racism. In fact, what I heard was more, probably the biggest participative exercise in democracy that I've ever taken part in in my lifetime. People were interested and engaged in the referendum 
and often very anxious about the decision that they were making in a way that I've never felt in any general election since I started really campaigning properly in 97. And most people I felt in the end that I met were weighing that decision very carefully. For them, it wasn't a clear cut choice, although the political debate would lead you to think otherwise. I think there, were small, there are small minorities on either side who feel strongly and passionately one way or another, but for most people, this was a finely balanced decision. And on balance, in the end, more than not told us that they thought that we should leave the European Union. Now, this creates a whole set of political problems, but where I don't agree with you is that it's a zero-sum game, that either you reject the result of the referendum or you, um, or you accept the vision of Brexit that Theresa May has on offer. We've already started that process in Parliament of forcing ministers to come to the dispatch box and account for themselves <coughs> and to accept that they need to publish a white paper so that we can debate what that future looks like. They are not doing what I believe needs to happen next, which is a real debate out in the country about what the shape of this country looks like after Brexit. But part of the reason that we're unable to do that at the moment is because the question hasn't been settled in Parliament as to whether we accept the result or not. Now, in my view, having heard a group of people shaking with anger, telling me that the European Union, in their view, is part of the problem but a much bigger problem about loss and change in their lives over the last 20, 30 years, and who told me very clearly that they were determined to make us sit up and listen, to turn around and say, we have, we've now decided that having delegated this decision to you, we don't accept the result, would be to say to them in the clearest possible terms, we are still not listening. And that is a breach of trust so great that I don't think that Labour or any other politician would be able to play any meaningful part in helping those communities to have a voice in what comes next. I don't believe that the vision that Theresa May has set out so far is one that most of my constituents were voting for. I think they were voting for much more local control, but I think they are also very realistic and on the main uh, positive about global relationships as well. I think on the leave and remain side there was a very shared desire around both of those things and I think there were also shared priorities around investment in skills for young people and the ability of young people to be able to get jobs here and overseas. I think there were shared priorities around um, investment in public services and I think there was something much more fundamental going on about the march of capital over the last few decades that more and more people have seen whether they're looking at ASOS or Sports Direct, they've seen how we are allowing major companies to play governments off against one another in order to gain advantage and drive down terms and conditions and they've seen the real life impact of that on their own lives. And actually this is a huge issue for for labour and for politicians because you know you look at a company like Walmart which controls you know it doesn't just own Asda and Boots it controls the distribution of drugs in this country it has reach in ways that many of us don't even really understand and when you look at a company like Walmart which has a uh, has a uh, you know is the size essentially of the economy of Norway it is no wonder then that people look at politics and are sceptical about the ability of politics and politicians to create change. And through the European Union, we should have been addressing that. We should have been doing that for a very long time and we absolutely catastrophically failed to do that. And people have spoken and the majority, by a slim minority I accept, but the majority have told us that they they don't accept that state of affairs any longer. And I have to say that when, in the last few years as an elected politician, I have gone and tried to have those conversations with people across Europe. And I felt that exact same desire that you just expressed from civil society, from trade unions, from, from ordinary people 
in European countries, but I didn't feel it from politicians. It's been a global failure of politics to respond to something very real that is happening in people's lives. And I am very determined now, finally, that they have stood up with such anger and told us, and I've heard it, that we are going to respond to that. There's a question here. So why is it that Theresa May's answer to this is to withdraw us from the single market, including the social contract that uh, entails, and then go and make us a leader in uh, free trade, offering nothing along the lines of a social contract to go with it? Free trade can be a fantastic thing, but it can also be horrendous, uh, depending on how it's managed. I mean, the story about the McDonald's you raised uh, replacing the World Man's Club. McDonald's wasn't from Europe, it was from America. We're yeah. supposed to go and uh, yeah. negotiate a massive free trade deal with them. We yeah. know vision from the Conservatives about what the social protections are. are. And you talk about this um, yeah. our vision for, okay, we want, we want to have a state that can still secure um, decent welfare for the many that need it and not pit people against each other. And you admit that costs money. But you said, well, are we going to do that through taxes for many, taxes for few? And I'm thinking, well, it might have been a while since we last saw it, but it used to be a thing for growth in the economy that could help the state, the state afford these, these things yeah. that we need. So when we combine this all together, what is our alternative vision? Because Theresa May's vision seems to be actually the, the answer of free trade without any special security or contract going forward yeah. is one that actually can make this problem worse for people when people vote for leaving EU. Yeah. What is our alternative vision? What is our social economic um, thing, well, offer going forward? And I know that's a big question. Oh, bloody hell. What do you think? <laughs> can you write the manifesto? <laughs> God, Paul. <laughs> You've got two minutes on that. <laughs> okay, so um, where do I start trying to answer that question? I suppose uh, what I would say is that... Um, I suppose where I'd start, really, in connecting up what I was saying about the sense of loss in constituencies like mine with a vision about where, Lib where Britain needs to go next is about... Is, w is where I started with this whole thing, really, about emotion and feeling. The, I think we talk a lot, for example, about creating jobs, but we don't think about the quality of those jobs, the opportunity that they provide. I think we don't talk very much about... We talked a lot in the last Parliament about cost of living, but we didn't talk about quality of life. It's partly, you know, some of the work that John has done around, you know, time to spend with your family and work that gives your life dignity and meaning. But, but I think in Labour for a long time we've needed to recover that sense of a much richer conversation about how we in government would help and enable people to live much richer, larger lives than they currently do. And that isn't a radical break from the past for Labour. That is actually where we started and how we were founded um, as a working class movement. And that is where I think we need to start the conversation about post-Brexit Britain. So to be really honest, I don't think that most of my constituents are very interested in the trade-off between free movement and the single market. The more that they hear about it, the more that they switch off. Somebody said to me in Tesco on Saturday after telling me his very strong views about me and about Jeremy Corbyn, uh, none of which was particularly complimentary in the cheese aisle. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, you know, why, why, you know, I don't know about this and why don't you just go and sort it out? 
And actually, I don't think most people in this country want us just to go and sort out anything, but I think they feel very clear about what they've told us to go and do, which is to recover some of those things that have been lost and start to give people some hope for the future. So it struck me for a, a long time. We've had a system where we inv invested in clean energy, for example, one of the areas that I know best. And energy is a huge component of the economy, a great driver of our growth. It's important to our pensions and our savings and our investments, but it's also uh, really important to, to future jobs and an industrial strategy. And we, we've lost a lot of those jobs in communities like mine over the last few years, and we're losing more. The last deep coal mine closed not very long ago in Yorkshire. And instead of investing in, for example, solar panels, which has been one of the biggest growth areas in the last few years until the Tories got their hands on it, instead of just saying, why don't we try and get young people into those jobs assembling and fitting solar panels, why aren't we doing what California has been doing, which is saying, let's use this combination of incentives and regulation in order to drive investment into this area, public and private, working together, in order to ensure that young people in towns like Wigan and Barnsley are designing the battery technology of the future. Why isn't our vision for Britain much more exciting than just saying we need to get young people into jobs or we need to end zero hours contracts? Why aren't we telling a story about how just as their grandparents in towns like Wigan powered us through the last century, young people now will power us through the next and help to change the world and save the planet as a consequence. This isn't just about jobs, this is about the life that people want to live, the hope that they want to feel for the future. And I think there are opportunities to do that in post-Brexit Britain. I think it would have been a damn sight easier to do that through working with our European partners in a reformed EU, and that was the case that I made. But having lost that argument, I'm not prepared to give up on that dream. I think it is possible. So I hope that get starts to give you a sense of where I'm going, even if I haven't got the vision totally worked out. That's great. Well, we've come to the end of our 90 minutes, so I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank you for your questions. Hopefully. You all found it illuminating. I, I think we had some fantastic answers there from Lisa, so I'd like to thank her most of all. Thanks, Thanks. a lot.